All right, hello, hello, and welcome to The Grill, Focus on AVOD, presented by FilmRise. I am Brandon Katz, the senior TV reporter at The Wrap, and I am a proud couch potato. And I think that makes me uniquely positioned to ask our panel of experts all about the television industry and the ever-fluid landscape we are experiencing right now. Before we dive into our conversation, let's just go around the digital room for some quick introductions. Daniel, let's start with you. Hi, everyone. I'm Daniel Christman. I'm currently SVP of the Cross-Platform Group at Screen Engine ASI. Tejas, how about you? Hi there. Uh, Tejas Shah from FilmRise. I am uh, SVP of Commercial Strategy and Analytics. Katina? Hi, everyone. I'm Katina pappas Walker. I lead our ad sales strategy for the Roku channel here at Roku. And Alicia? Hello, everyone. I'm Alicia Dino. Uh, I work for Global CTV Ad Server Publica. So as you can see, just from those brief introductions, we have a lot of smart people plugged into the industry for this panel. So I'm excited to learn. I hope everybody else is too. And just to start things off, one result of the study that you guys put out that immediately stood out to me is that AVOD, Advertising Video On Demand, is quickly becoming the first touch point in most Americans' living room. And I'd love to go around this digital room to hear from you know, a content tech publisher and broader industry's perspective, what the ripple effect of AVOD becoming the epicenter of the media experience will be in each of your given corners of the industry. And Daniel, let's start with you again. Yeah, I think from the market research side, we're expecting everybody to kind of want to delve in, clients specifically, and kind of figure out how this industry is evolving. And we're at a time right now when um, the, the terms AVOD and FAST are, are still new to everybody. But um, once a, a lot of the major players in the space are kind of able to come to a shared understanding, we really expect the, the industry to change and evolve. And we're right on the precipice of that now. Yeah, um, just to piggyback on that, you know, I, I think that uh, AVOD and FAST have both kind of flown under the radar um, for the past few years. I think it came more into the cultural lexicon in, in 2021 and, and definitely to the forefront in, in 22. Um, what that means to me is sort of uh, thinking about the evolution of what our value proposition is. I think there was a lot of innovation and experimentation happening um, till now. Uh, and now that we're kind of hitting a critical mass in terms of the size of the audience, uh, we need to make sure that we're, we're sort of a, a relatively mature product. Um, you know, because it's you know, modern technology, you know, there's always going to be iterations and, and that's exciting. Um, but ultimately, we need to be able to differentiate ourselves from, from traditional TV and, and show the audience uh, that we value them and, and why they should be using a lot and fast as opposed to other media. Um, and that includes social media, which is, is now getting a lot of eyeballs as well. Yeah, I think, you know, cord cutting has obviously accelerated and at Roku, we've really just tried to make cord cutting as simple and enjoyable as possible. I think the next frontier here is making the advertising experience better. The ad experience in linear was unchanged for so many years and there's so much that streaming can build on um, learning from a lot of that, but also making it dynamic for different people and the way that they want to enjoy content. So I'm um, really excited to, to see how that evolves. I, uh, I actually love this question. Um, so thank you for kicking it off like this and I'll counter it with a fun fact. The great shift to AVOD is a consumer trend that was always happening pre-pandemic. So the trend that was trending is still trending, right? And the world changed rapidly. Every household experienced a global lockdown, which naturally accelerated AVOD discovery. Um, I also think there are other variables to consider that we, we often maybe don't talk about, like the cost of living crisis, right? So prices increases um, on everyday items, which will naturally have people looking for more affordable ad-supported streaming services or ad light SVOD services. Well, Alicia, I appreciate the compliment you led off with, and I will tell everyone here <laughs> that flattery will get you everywhere in this panel. So just keep that in mind over the next 45 minutes. Uh, but, you know, something I'm particularly interested in, because I remember the early days of AVOD where no disrespect to this brand, but I, I would see the same laggy Geico commercial over and over and over at every single ad break. So Katina and Alicia, I'm particularly interested in your viewpoints of how the AVOD model has developed over the last decade from both a tech standpoint 
and a consumer experience standpoint, because we are clearly at a, a much more advanced stage than we ever have been. Yeah, Alicia, I can kick this off for us. So um, I, I agree actually with Alicia's sentiments. This, this has been a, something that we've been seeing at Roku for years. We launched the Roku channel about five years ago because we saw over and over again that our users were searching for the word free. They would buy a Roku device and then they'd be like, wait, I have to authenticate? That's confusing. So um, agree with you. When we launched, it was definitely a little clunky and the content was maybe a little stale, but um, that has also increased uh, tremendously over the last five years as well. So I think it's about learning quickly and being nimble and, and actually understanding what your users want, doing you know surveys of your users, understanding um, what they need. I think Fast was also another iteration of that. We were largely video on demand and learned that cord cutters as they were coming to the Roku channel wanted a lean back experience too. They were used to watching linear TV for so many years um, that they wanted the duality of I can surf like I do on Netflix and, you know, lean in and, you know, go between pieces of content or something where they could sit on the couch and watch one fast channel and not have to think so much. So um, I think, again, really looking at that data, seeing who's leaning in to what and, and programming accordingly and also building, again, as I mentioned earlier, the ad experience um, to sort of pair together there uh, will just increase engagement and, and reach overall. Yeah, I, listen, I, I agree. I think TV viewers will always pay for content they value and can't find elsewhere. Um, this is why I believe content is king. Um, however, TV viewers are on a journey at the moment. Sometimes they like scheduled TV, which is why we are seeing a resurgence of fast services. Um, others, it's all about the immediacy of content consumption, right? Which is why we see people leaning into an on-demand service. Um, I think it's user-driven uh, and users have varying taste. And I also think, you know, CTV is the newest kid on the block, right? So like Katina had mentioned, I think apps are evolving, the way they're building ad breaks are evolving because we're leaning in and building based on where the industry is going um, and, and how we're curating the user experience. I, I love that you both are, are really emphasizing the user experience and how user driven this medium is and how it is nimble compared to essentially the traditional entertainment model remaining unchanged for decades. So just to open this back up to everybody, what is it about over the top platforms that allow them to be more dynamic and fluid than their legacy counterparts? Yeah, I think I can kick that off. I, I mean, I, I think just to piggyback off of what Katina and Alicia just said, it, it is the optionality of the experience, you know, having, no ads, limited ads, or that lean back experience that uh, a fast linear channel has. Um, and, and also, you know, leveraging modern technology, leveraging the broadband infrastructure and, and the ability to customize user interfaces or customize discovery. Uh, that's a capability that didn't exist in, in the legacy world. And I think that one of the detriments of, of that traditional bundle was, you know, having to pay for um, a, a huge package of channels where you might be using 20%, if, if not that. So, you know, now we're, we're, we're creating that, that level of customization and we're offering a lot for free, most importantly. So um, acknowledging the audience and kind of bringing them uh, to the forefront of, of the services, emphasizing user experience and, and making sure that, that we engage the audience as best as possible, I think is, is the ultimate value add. It's really exciting that there's been so much growth in this space, yet there still is room to continue growing. And you know, as all of us on, the, on this call are kind of talking about the fact that the audience and, and user are always first, as we're able to continue optimizing that experience, there's that much more growth to continue on in this space. And I think at this point, if, if you're an advertiser and you're looking for that adult 18 to 49 audience, you have to come to streaming to get it, right? Um, for the first time in second quarter, Nielsen reported that adults 18 to 49 were spending as much time streaming as they were in linear TV. So that was something that we all saw coming, right? But for it to actually happen and, and to Daniel's point, that that's only the beginning, right? We don't think it's just going to plateau there, right? So I think 
uh, Alicia mentioned this too, but consumers have way more choices now. So we really have to speak to them in a way that works for them or they'll go somewhere else and do something else and be on another screen. So it's really up to us to make sure that we're, we're being dynamic and nimble, as, as I mentioned, to, to continue that growth. I, I was just reading an article about this very thing. You know, traditional TV advertisers would cast a wide net, right? Like I was reading the I Love Lucy, Philip Morris was hoping that he was reaching smokers, but we all know that he wasn't, right? A whole family, a whole household would be watching that show. And that's something so exciting for advertisers to understand with CTV, right? They can actually reach a very specific user inside of what they're pushing as a brand. Um, so I, I agree with everybody on the panel. I think the world's evolving, digital is evolving. Um, I think we're gonna see some of that transition over into CTV and, and because it's so new, there is a bit of a growth spurt. So there is still a lot of room for everybody to figure out best practices um, and, and figure out what that evolution looks like as an industry together for the first time. Just to piggyback on, on what Alicia said, I, I think there's um, an alignment between not only the uh, consumer's experience or the audience experience, but also the advertiser's experience. And I think that that's a really cool dynamic to, to show respect to both, and, and whether it's you know, not inundating the consumer with advertisements that they don't want or giving that level of, of targeting or addressable audience that the advertisers want. Um, we're finally aligning those, those two goals. And so that's uh, really exciting. And I just think adding fuel to this fire is the fact that U.S. cord cutting households are projected to overtake U.S. pay TV households in the next three years. So like you guys all said, we, we are at a nexus point, but growth is still very much uh, up ahead and we are still seeing massive changes. And I think to that point, we have seen Netflix lose subscribers in each of the past two quarters. Other streamers such as Peacock have remained flat. We're obviously still waiting to see what happens with you know Paramount Plus, Disney Plus, HBO Max. But what, if anything, does this potential deceleration of pure SVOD growth say about the industry at the moment and the viability of AVOD and SaaS, which is what we're all here to talk about? I was just going to say, I think the point of entry is really important. Like the, um, Someone made the point earlier about having so many wasted channels when you're buying you know, a, a large cable package and you're watching three things. Like I do still believe in SVOD, and I think that you know, as new products come out, users are gonna test them and, and subscribe to them and some people will forget to unsubscribe, however it works, but they'll always need AVOD to complement that and to actually um, you know, round out their debundled cable or you know, traditional um, broadcast offering. So I think they're, as long as, again, we're doing the right things to make sure that the content's there, the ad experience is there, um, that will continue to be the case no matter how many SVOD services. And if anything, we've all learned that people who, you know, launched as a traditional or a SVOD only service um, do need those ads. Netflix, Disney Plus, they're prime examples of that. And Hulu has been very successful in, in, in the way that they've had options this for the last, you know, five or six years. So I think that trend will continue to emerge as well. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it, it's exactly that the the hybridization of, of all of these models combining SVOD, AVOD and FAST together. Um, there's it also speaks to the economic realities that we're in right now and, and what has happened in, in terms of SVOD stacking. You know, it, it's just not everyone can be direct to consumer and, and we're kind of seeing uh, the fallout of, of a little too much of that. Um, and, and so, yeah, ultimately seeing hybrid models uh, I, I think is is what we're going to see going forward. And, um, you know, speaking to the viability of AVOD and FAST, it, it just underscores that um, ads aren't necessarily a bad thing. I, I think that uh, Netflix kind of made it a, a bad word initially. Um, and I, I think that now we're seeing the legitimization again um, of, of advertising and, and how consumers uh, don't mind them and actually really want um, the same way they want content discovery, also want product discovery as well. Uh, it's su super fascinating, right? I mean, SVOD services for the first time are exploring ad light options for users. Um, so I think it's where the industry is heading because I think it's more about the user's choice versus subscription or ad supported. So 
I actually think both will always exist in our ecosystem. Um, it'll just be about user preference. And I also kind of think users follow content. I mean, so if four seasons of a show live across three CTV apps, users are going to flow in and out of both AVOD and SVOD services to continue consuming that content. Um, I think we're seeing it happen now, which is why I kind of like the collaboration that's happening across OS systems, devices, apps, um, you know, and I, I think as we watch those bundles continue, um, it's only going to help consumers understand discoverability. And is, isn't that the beauty, though, also of AVOD, right, is it feels like this really crowded ecosystem. But has anyone ever met a, a consumer or, or even any of us who doesn't want more, better, diverse content? People will always be searching for that. And, and again, the beauty of AVOD and Bass channels is that they've almost entirely removed that barrier to entry. So as you know, audiences and consumers are moving in and out of all of these services, um, AVOD and, and the technology and the evolution is making it that much easier. You know, to be fair, Daniel, I think my 70-year-old father could subsist on World War II content alone for the rest of his TV viewing life. But of course, that is a minority. You're right, that we all want a diverse slate of content and I want to stick with this idea of hybridization for a moment, because another thing that stood out to me from the FilmRise Screen Engine study is that 60% of streaming users use both AVOD and SVOD. Now, on the surface, I think that this somewhat suggests that we're just remixing the cable bundle of old. And there has been a, a small kind of minority concern from some consumers that we are heading in the same direction. But you guys have touched on it already, but I wonder if you could expand how does this new medium, you know, SVOD, AVOD, and fast combinations offer an evolution of that as the existing model? You know, how does it improve and provide a better experience for consumers that essentially builds on what, what we've had while still offering something new? I think the, the, the key value proposition is that being built on an uh, over-the-top infrastructure, um, the, the level of data that, that we have as a, as a platform and as a content aggregator um, allows us to cater to the audience a, a lot better. Um, it, it allows us to understand user behavior um, you know, at the granularity of every second of the day and, and help the user out with you know, whether it's content discovery, if we see that the user is you know, searching for a very long time and then ultimately like not watching any content at all, which is a behavior we see often. You know, what we did was we, we optimized our, our discovery algorithm uh, in order to uh, cater much more or much better um, to the individual user. Um, that's just not possible in, in the legacy infrastructure. And um, you know, that goes both ways. A again, the, the aligning of um, you know, the advertiser's goals and, and the consumer's goals. So again, leveraging analytics, leveraging data uh, to provide for advertisers a value proposition saying you, you can target um, this user specifically, they are, and, and also from the user's perspective, you know, assessing, you know, are you open to this ad? Um, or this this type of ad or this type of format uh, and being able to customize for that. The advent of the SVOD players did something amazing, right? It, it put these massive libraries of content at um, consumers' fingertips for the first time. Um, that's, that's a really big deal. I mean, it's done in music, obviously, as well. Um, changes the way we all consume. But I think that, you know, in our heart of hearts, if we had really sat and thought at the time Brandon, as you, as you were mentioning, that Netflix kind of had this narrative that ads are bad. We kind of all knew that it would come full circle in a way. But just because we're, we're feeling that it's come full circle, it doesn't mean that we haven't taken a massive leap forward. And it, and it makes so much sense that AVOD has, has come to kind of be a partner and remove that friction for consumers as they're looking for additional content, um, despite the fact that we still think that the SVOD services are, are, are fulfilling a really important function for consumers in, in delivering um, you know, this, this massive amount of content to let people all find what they want. Yeah, just to piggyback off of that, I, I mean, ultimately, having all the content at your fingertips is um, an advent in itself. You know, just having that, that ability uh, to rediscover old things or, you know, what, what FilmRise really prides itself on is having been able to uh, reintroduce old classics to younger audiences that, that were not even born um, when these things aired. Um, so that's, that's a really fun part of, of what I do is kind of assessing 
um, where something old or might apply to or, or uh, appeal to, to a newer audience or vice versa, you know, bringing digital native and, and user generated content uh, to older audiences. Yeah, you know, Tay, just to that point, I think every fellow 90s baby such as myself has that, oh my God, I've just discovered Cheers for the first time moment. And it is a, a special sort of full circle function of these platforms that help funnel what is old, what is new content to uh, users. And I think it's a great way to keep people on the hook. Now I am curious to kind of go a little bit more macro. Disney just claimed it set a $9 billion record at its upfront with 40% of that going to digital. Comcast said it had a huge upfront as well with a, a significant portion of that ad money going to digital. It has been growing over years, but are we at a point where advertisers will begin truly significantly rerouting even more resources away from traditional media and towards digital for the foreseeable future? I think it really depends on the brand. We, we're seeing you know, different brands feel differently about it. I think there is still power in linear TV. I'm, I work at a streaming company, but I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna, um, you know, try to try to counter that. The Super Bowl still does reach millions and millions of people in one, in one sort of moment, right? And I think there's there's definitely um, there's definitely power there. I think, you know, a lot of what we've been reading in the upfront. Um, doesn't surprise me. I, I think we've seen the last three years, it, it has definitely accelerated. Um, and the, the, I'll call them the savvy or smart um, buyers are definitely leaning more heavily into streaming. One thing that's been really exciting at Roku is, you know, when I um, started negotiating upfronts here, you know, we were sort of at the tail end of, of those conversations. I used to be a TV buyer. I remember, okay, Memorial Day, you start with broadcast networks, you progress through cable, and then you do sort of the digital and the unwired networks at the end, right? Um, we now are part of the earlier conversations and um, announced that we closed our first $1 billion upfront, which is super exciting and obviously a huge milestone for our team. So I, I do think that, you know, there's still a ton of growth there and, and people are definitely still spending in linear and they should. Um, but it, it is, we are earlier, earlier in the conversation, which I think is a sign that buyers know how important the audience is. And again, I think it comes back to that younger viewer and knowing that the key demographic for, for advertisers for as long as I've been in advertising is that, is that 18 to 49 um, audience and if you if you want that audience that's digital and and streaming first yeah I, I agree I mean I think we're following the trends and I think the whole world follows the trends right as do advertisers so if I think about it a more traditional TV ad budget that enters CTV is going to have expectations to provide the same level of data and transparency that is a part of the TV linear ad buy um, and I, when I think about it that way, I think CTV apps that make it easily available to advertisers will likely see these budgets versus those that are a bit more guarded around their data. Um, but I think advertisers have to reach their audience and their audience is streaming content. Their audiences are accelerating how much they stream content. So it's going to be a big part of what they plan for their years now. And actually just to, that's a great point, Alicia. And I think that this isn't something that just happens every upfront year. It's the it's the in between that really matters. It's the education, the data that the streamers can provide. And um, I think one of the best parts about working at Roku is how consultative we can be with our clients to show them, like, look, we're just giving you the information. You know, you can make the decision on your own. But um, we didn't have that luxury, you know, when we were just relying on Nielsen ratings, right? So there's just so much more data that we can tell the story of how this is evolving and how it contributes to their bottom line. Almost all of our upfront partners have, you know, some sort of measurement learning agenda baked into their entire upfront, um, you know, their upfront year. And that has been tremendously important in showing the value and actually putting our, you know, money where our mouth is. So that's it. That's a huge, huge point. Yeah, I mean, look, every week we see a new press announcement that a major broadcaster has partnered with this verification company or this measurement company 
Um, so everybody's talking about best practices and, and how do we actually show measurement on, on viewability or, or how do we actually show the data of where the ads delivered. Um, and so I think we're all coming to a place where we're pushing each other to do better, to support streaming content, to support advertising measurement, to be able to do supply path optimization, buy path optimization, um, and to leverage that in our day-to-day -day negotiations, you know, and I, and I think, I think Katina's right, like where we didn't have that transparency before for streaming inventory, we had it for digital. So for the first time ever, we're able to say, hey, we've been doing this in digital and it's been working. Um, and now we can actually push to apply that over here on the TV uh, side of it as well. Coming all the way back to the, to the question, I think as industry analysts, that is how we will know that this market has become mature. It's when those ad dollars catch up and we start seeing um, the upfront spend matching the audience size. And I think we're working our way there, um, but it will be really interesting for us to keep an eye on that. So on this trajectory that we're seeing in the, land, in the industry, audiences vote with their wallets. They have the deciding power. And I thought what was interesting in the study is that it showed that just one in five consumers plan to add an additional SBOD service in the next year. And 79% report keeping or, keeping or even reducing their current subscription. I think consumers have had it amazingly in terms of volume of quality choice. But do you guys think that the industry is on the verge of entering a period of consolidation and potentially even a reduction of major players? I actually think it might be the wrong question. I think we're in the early stages of app discovery. I think the real question is, what does the future of search look like in TV? How do they continue to promote their services on devices? How do they stay relevant? I mean, we all understand on this call and in this panel how to access apps on our TVs and the differences of where you can go to access content. However, not everyone else understands how to discover more content, new apps. I mean, it's getting so granular in a way where my, my mom's in town visiting and she doesn't understand that if she clicks a show in Apple TV Plus, it pushes her over into a brand new app that just launched this year, right? So I, I'd love to hear everybody's thoughts on that. I think that's the question. How do we make this searchable and discoverable for the audiences that are accessing this content every day? Yeah, I mean, to, to that end, it, it's, uh, it goes back to, it, it's a challenge and an opportunity at the, at the same time where, um, you know, the having or leveraging uh, digital technology uh, allows us to be in this environment where where searchability is actually a thing, um, and you know creating that discovery is definitely going to be reliant on on data and analytics, and, and that's why I hope there's a little bit more democratization of that, um, so that we're we're all on on the same playing field and and able to uh, surface to the audience um, what it is exactly that they want. I mean, I think that we really should be taking the lead of, of what we've seen in the digital landscape in, in terms of search uh, keywords, um, everything that's happened with, with Google and, and AdWords and, and within that industry, uh, even in Facebook and, and Snap, et cetera. Um, that, that level of, of customization in terms of uh, discoverability or, or being able to push to individual consumers according to their preferences, I think it's going to be hugely important going forward. I don't think, you know, I don't, I agree with Alicia that it's, it's probably less about the consolidation and more about share shifting and how much time is spent in each of these different arenas. I think it'll also show heavily in the way that publishers program, you know, you, you need to have a mix of um, sort of the nostalgic content that's more efficient and provides just engagement. And then you'll also need original content to bring in new users and, you know, have users, someone made the point earlier that users follow content. I totally agree with that. If all of your friends are watching something, especially if it's ad supported and, you know, the, the barrier for entry is super low, the user will follow that much more easily. So I think there's more a share shift happening. Um, and, and it'll allow us to understand if that consolidation um, trend is is next. The one thing I will say on, on the consolidation piece is we've learned that the more content that you can put in one place, the 
better engagement is because users do like spending more time in one place rather than having to juggle between a million apps. So that doesn't mean necessarily that, you know, content publishers are going to shut their doors, but is there a way for us to make the UI of, of any of these interfaces of the streaming platforms more aggregated? So, you know, the users recommended things that maybe does cross between different apps um, in a way that's obviously economically sound to all, all the providers, um, rather than the user being the onus being on the user to jump between one app to the other. We've seen the number of apps that users access on a monthly basis go down. They're spending more time and less. Um, so I do think that that, that will continue, um, especially as people, you know, get their sort of cord cutting routine down. So I'll, I'll shamelessly plug uh, Roku on, on Continuous behalf, which is, you know, I, I love to her point in terms of having a UI that, that aggregates and creates this great user experience. Um, on Roku, the, the feature free section to me uh, is something I absolutely love. And it's a little bit selfish in, in that we, we often see Film Rise's content being featured there. But it, it's just incredible to just have these curated rows of content but they're all from different apps. And so that ability to interact with all these different apps uh, in, in one place, in one store, um, I, I think is, and Apple TV Plus does this to an extent, um, there's a lot of different channel stores that are, that are attempting to do this. Um, but I definitely think that that is the, uh, the future of content discovery. Yeah, the genie is clearly out of the bottle, right? It's going to take quite some time for there to be any significant aggregation. But in the meantime, I think what we're all saying is, to whatever extent we can make that experience more seamless for audiences, we're going to see uh, viewer time continue to increase. And I think that's kind of um, the overall goal of the industry. Everyone is talking a lot here about content discovery, app discovery, and, and kind of seamless convenience for the user. I'm curious because in the pandemic, studies have shown that streaming usage meant among older demographics, people who have not cut the cord has actually increased. And I'm curious moving forward, how important is it to target those demographics and to continue broadening the type of uh, uh, user demographic bases that streaming services uh, attract? Because that seems to be a, a huge untapped market that is still finding its footing. Yeah, I mean, that, that's core to, to um, Film Rise's strategy and, and overall company thesis. Uh, it, it's... Um, introducing content, uh, like, and I mentioned this before, but taking nostalgic content, introducing it to a, a younger audience, and then vice versa, you know, showing um, the, these the new older audiences, to your point, uh, what is this, this content ecosystem that has been developed um, over several years that they hadn't been a part of until now. Um, and I think that we're seeing great reception of that, where uh, you know older audiences are um, enjoying that they are being introduced to a new format. And even then, some of these formats aren't necessarily new; they're, they're just uh, innovations or evolutions of of what has been known for a long time. So um, that diversity of audience is is hugely important to us. And you know, I think that the Wall Street Journal published. Uh, that statistic most recently, that the greatest contributor to streaming growth um, over the past year has been uh, those age 50 and older. Um, and, and that's really exciting to me uh, to have that opportunity to now speak to the whole, um, all of demographics and, and be able to offer up a, a diverse catalog of content. Yeah, I think streaming is mainstream now, which is really exciting. I think for it to get anywhere close to the power of linear television, it has to be mass reach. So I've spent a lot of time in this panel sort of plugging the 18 to 49 audience, but the the 50 plus audience should not be ignored here. And I think it also just shows, you know, how seamless the experience is that, you know, people who have been watching linear TV for 30 plus years are making that shift and staying cord cutters. Um, so I, I think it's a good thing to have a diverse um, audience watch it, watching. Um, and to Tejas's point, the content needs to speak to them. And I think we also see, you know, a, an adult 50 plus watching sometimes the same thing as somebody in their 30s. So um, that's that's positive. And I just think, lastly, as it relates to advertisers, that's where the messaging matters. Alicia used the "I Love Lucy" example earlier. 
I think the the beauty of this happening is if an advertiser doesn't want to reach that audience, they don't have to anymore. They, they can just buy the demo that's important to them that they know will move the needle for their brand. And then there's also options for people who want, you know, mass reach that uh, it's a product that no matter how old or young you are, you need it. They can do that too in a really efficient way. Yeah, I was just thinking about um, my mom being in town, right? And, and how she used to watch TV, like how she grew up watching TV was a set day schedule, the news comes on or the show airs its new episode on a certain day. And it's been really exhilarating to introduce her to streaming. Um, I think she said something like, how many hours can I watch of that show? And I, I don't want to plug that show, but you know, that show is epic and everybody was rushing to watch it. Um, and, and yeah, so it's, it's actually just educating an older audience that's already been consuming on ridiculous levels, more traditional TV into accessing streaming where like Teos and, and, and most of us have mentioned nostalgic content, both TV shows and movies. I can't even tell you my, my partner's father was talking about all the Westerns he used to love and how he hates just waiting for them to come on traditional TV. So we got to actually introduce him to a streaming app that has a whole section for that. So um, I think we're seeing a different togetherness at the household level, right? I think that's what I'm talking about. Is you're seeing people coming together, educating older people and their family on how to access this stuff. Um, I was just showing my mom how to use the remote confidently for the new Apple device. Um, you know, so I think we all come together to watch shows. Um, we all come together to share in that. I mean, half the time my colleagues and I are talking about the latest movie or, or TV show or we're educating the younger um, colleagues of ours on, on more traditional stuff. And, and I think that that's something that's never going to stop. That's something that's always going to happen. So there's always going to be room. So then I just go back to that idea of, of easy discoverability, right? When my mom goes home, is she going to be able to go and find that? And I think like you guys have mentioned, there are certain apps that are really focused on promoting content that might direct you to another app. Um, and, and I think that's a really strong place to be. But I do love it. I think we're in a more thoughtful industry right now. All of us on this panel are constantly thinking about users. We're thinking about each other and how we partner and help each other and support each other. Um, and that is a really great place to be. And to your point, Alicia, my mother still thinks the term is blissing TV, not binging TV. So <laughs> it has been fun to help her, you know, uh, leap forward into the 21st century in certain regards. Uh, now, piggybacking off these last couple questions, Amazon Prime Video is an added value to Prime subscribers. The Disney bundle offers three separate services for roughly, you know, the price of one. I'm curious, do you think we'll see a renewed emphasis on this type of creative bundling and added value moving forward as the competition for subscription dollars, ad dollars, and eyeballs increase? I think it's uh, it's all of the above. So everything that we've just talked about in, in the past uh, 40 minutes or so, um, you know, it's it's creative bundling, it's hybridization, it's content discovery. It, it's all of these kind of user focused or user centric applications that we've been able to develop um, because of the the advancements of technology. Uh, I think that that is uh, going to be at the forefront of, of how we go moving forward. Um, you know, creative bundling is, is still a, a bifurcation, to be honest, of, of the actual cable bundle. So then how do you bundle bundles? Um, I, I, that will be very interesting to see. Yeah, I think it's all about testing and learning all of this, right? Like, I think the reason that all these companies are able to do that is because they understand in real time how it's impacting their bottom line, how they're retaining users, how they're drawing new users, how it's increasing engagement. So I think if it weren't for that sort of um, quick, quick learning and failing fast um, model, you know, it would be a lot tougher for anyone to do anything creative. So I think that's one of the things that makes me most excited about working in this industry is, you know, you can test and learn um, and continue to iterate on your strategy rather than just be like, I think I have a good idea. So um, I think that that will definitely continue for sure. Yeah, and to whatever extent entertainment has you know, completely broken through all silos and become integrated with every aspect of technology and daily life, that just means that there's more opportunities for the discovery that we're all talking about. So 
um, finding all of these partners, amazing partners that we've all worked with, you know, across uh, CPG and, and, and tech. Um, these are great avenues for content discovery and ultimately have really helped um, to fuel that explosive growth that's let all of us kind of work in this awesome space. And I think actually sort of building on that, it, there's also just a, a lot of cool partnerships that aren't even all content driven, right? We've seen a lot of examples where content publishers are partnering with food delivery services. So, you know, I think there's a lot that... Um, it's creating sort of opening doors between industries that wouldn't have been open before, which is awesome. I mean, I think all of us have, we're blown away by the way we started this year off with the Super Bowl having a QR code, right? So I think everything is on the table. Um, anything is possible and attainable. And, and like Katina had mentioned, we're in an environment where we actually can test. We can be forgiven for a mistake and relaunch it. And um, so I, I think it's an incredibly fun time. I see ads that I've never seen in a TV space on my connected TV devices when I'm streaming. And that's also very exciting. Thinking about the advertisers that traditionally didn't have the budget to get their ads on a TV environment now have the opportunity to actually reach their audiences and their audiences are in streaming. So I would agree. I think discoverability, the ease and the simplicity of that is going to keep pushing this forward. Yeah, I think it is really interesting to think of the TV is a brand discovery. We've been talking a lot about content discovery, but finding a new brand through your television, I think we've all become so used to it in social, but as we're seeing this in real time as users, it is happening on the, on the largest screen in the house, which is obviously such an amazing storytelling vehicle. So I'm really excited to see how that continues and, and you know, gets, more, um, gets more brands involved. Now, last quick question. I'll get everybody out of here. Throughout this conversation, we've been talking about both micro and macro details about the industry. I want to switch focus a little bit. What do you think is the most overlooked element of the streaming industry in each of your respective areas right now? You know, a storyline that isn't receiving as much attention as it should. I think from the, the content perspective, um, and this is a, a little bit uh, playing into some of the themes we've already talked about, but um in terms of bringing in new content uh, the diversity of content whether it's from uh countries outside of north america in different languages or whether it's user generated content you know one initiative that we've been working on recently is taking digital native content that was previously seven minutes uh developing uh longer form um episodes out of that and and creating fast channels based on that type of content so the 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 diversification of the content ecosystem um and, and sort of uh the democratization of that i think is is really interesting it, it's not just your major studios that are able to create content right now it's uh it goes down to the individual user at this point and that's really cool to me i think building on that multicultural is probably an area that we don't spend enough time talking through. I think it's awesome, again, that we've reached mass scale in these areas. But um, to Tejas's point on the democratization of content, you know, you used to have a day part that served different multicultural audiences. And that's, you know, that's great. And that worked, but this allows it to be more nuanced to, uh, there's so many, you know, US um, multicultural audiences that speak both languages and, you know, want to be talked to with cultural relevance, but also in with content that, you know, might be in English, right? So I think that coming together and this, so multicultural is one, my other one would probably be um, TCOM. It's, I wouldn't say it's overlooked. I would just say it's nascent. I, you know, we've been talking about interactive on CTV for years with um, partners like Brightline and Innovid. And I think it's been like a, a nice to have for a lot of brands, but I'm really excited to see how that, um, continues to evolve and, you know, gets better. People used to say that there was no way that people would shop on their phones, right? And now look at us. So <laughs> I think that, that that is sort of the next iteration and it'll be really um, fun to see what we can do both from the advertiser perspective, but then also the, the value that it provides to our users. I think um, I selfishly feel like we're not focused enough on building the right ad break and the right ad experience. So to Katina's point, like in-language ad unit for in-language content, right? 
Um, so I think it's something that is being discussed. Frequency capping is a major buzzword, but I also think people aren't talking enough about the right technologies being utilized to support this type of inventory, this type of content, right? Um, building an ad break for a content owner who has distributed content over into another app. There are walled gardens where the ad stacks aren't talking to each other. Um, so I'd love a world in which we focus a little bit more on that. Uh, but again, it's selfish as a global CTV ad server to be asking for that. No, this is a great segue because I just wanted to touch on this really briefly before we all wrapped. Um, the concept that potentially um, viewers want or uh, are not conscious of the fact that they want an ad break. And I think that as uh, Katina was mentioning, you know, um, mobile usage, we're all we're all multitasking right now. At one point, it was kind of a buzzword, like the concept that you were you know, using two screens. But now it's just, you know, so native to all of our experiences. But I think that um, that's really going to help fast channels as we move forward, that um, the right break is actually something that people want. So we'll really be able to capitalize on that. And that's, you know, um, a perfect opportunity for our, our ad partners. I really want to thank everybody for taking the time to come for this discussion today, because you know what, I feel like I could go teach a lecture on it based on the expertise I've absorbed from all of you guys. I really appreciate it. I hope maybe next year we can all reconvene and take the temperature once again of this ever fluid, ever evolving landscape. So thank you guys again. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Brandon. Thank you.